It's a great honor to be here. Uh, some of you I saw yesterday with the class, I'll refer a little bit to that. But my title today is exceedingly pretentious, as if I could offer you paradise. <laughs> That's the job of the churches down the road, and I don't want to take away from them. I'll refer to a particular kind of paradise that concerns multilingualism in a political entity, such as you have in Auckland or where I am now in Melbourne, an entity that welcomes people from the outside. I extend congratulations to Vanessa, who woke this morning uh, as a New Zealand citizen. Right. Yesterday, yesterday she began. <laughs> no matter how much we theorize that the nation state is dead and cultures are mixed and everything is free flowing, it still means something. As indeed did the Maori spoken here at the beginning. It's not just symbolic, it's also felt. And with that, I've introduced all my main topics. <laughs> in 1992, I was just beginning in this field. That was my first book, and it's from the first paragraph. I don't like to cite myself. That's terrible, isn't it? Unless I want to correct myself. In 1992, translation studies was becoming an independent discipline and needed to affirm itself. And if you wanted to get somebody excited about translation, you would talk about the complexity of the cognitive operations. That's still a wealth of unexplained mysteries. You can still get excited about that. Or about the macro level, the fact that everything we know from the culture from beyond the culture we're born into has come through some kind of process of translation. And it therefore follows that all our cultures are in some way translations of other cultures. It's not just this little marginal service we sometimes provide to those who need it. It's something huge in the very constitution of our cultural identities. And those statements are based on a kind of epistemological a truism that if there are cultures that are free of translation, well, we don't know about them. We can't know about them, since translation is the form of that knowledge of the other. That was it in 1992, when we wanted translation to be independent. And I was in that very much. These days, though, that epistemology of finding out about the other, of can we really know what the other culture is? That seems to be the epistemology of anthropologists and spies, if not conquerors. It seems to be an epistemology based on we are here, they are there, and there is this separation allowing for mediation. These days, we don't think like that, or I'm not thinking like that. I don't know when I changed. There was no moment of epiphany and suddenly, oh, it's completely different. But I look around now at what I'm working on and the, and the kinds of places that my trainees go into, and I find that, no, it's how do we live together in a polis, in a political unit, with our different languages, understanding each other where needed, recognizing our differences where needed, minimizing conflict. That seems to me today the most pressing challenge. If we can get it right anywhere in the world and learn some valid lessons, it can be extended to most of the world's cities, many of which are trying to do this and failing terribly. I lived in France. I was in Paris doing my doctorate at the time. And my, my big kids are there now. You know, when the Arabic-speaking parts of the outer banlieue are burning cars because they're not integrated and don't feel included. And it's very palpable. The failure is very, very palpable in this area. Places like Auckland, or indeed Melbourne, where I am now, stand out as, as um, administrative government awareness that this is the challenge we face and we think we can do it. It's worth working at it, uh, maintaining the diversity rather than referring back to that 19th century American model of the melting pot. That is the challenge and it's worth working on. 
And that's how I put translation into it. You notice I've got inclusive, democratic, multilingual, okay? Democratic means everybody participates. And inclusive, it's a much used term these days for having access to health services and legal services, or whatever. Um, I, I uh, in, read it in a linguistic sense of the subject, the person, identifies with the laws. So Vanessa, having become a New Zealand citizen, now feels that she is co-author of the laws and can speak about our laws instead of their laws. Okay, that's straight from Habermas. I think it's, it's a noble ideal. It's very, very hard to achieve, but, but it's interesting because I, I do lots of interview research these days and I look carefully at the pronouns people use. Do they situate themselves in one or the other? And accents tell you a lot more as well about how people situate themselves. Inclusive in a linguistic sense. I'm speaking uh, today from material on the basis of material gathered through a European project. So I'm not talking about Auckland. I'm not talking about Melbourne. These are places I want to discover. I've been involved in this project called MIME focusing on mobility and inclusion. Uh, not everybody in that project, it's a big project with 23 universities involved. Uh, we don't share common definitions of those terms. But the idea behind it is that any language policy we have has to be able to accommodate these two things. It has to enable people to be mobile. Okay, that's what's new. Europe needs mobility of the labor force because it has mobility of capital. If you don't have mobility of capital and mobility of labor, labor loses. That's a quick course in practical applied Marxism, but <laughs> it's basic economics. Uh, so that is a aim and inclusion. And the challenge is how do you enable inclusion into, into society at the same time as you enable mobility? And we have a model. It's by an economist called Francois Grain. And you can't see the fine print, but you'll find that if you look for MIME and anything but that symbol, which is the project on it. Uh, this keeps us going, 23 universities, pondering what this model means. It's a model of trade-offs. And the trade-off says you've got desirable factor one, inclusion here, desirable factor two, mobility here. And you can have some solutions that enable maximum inclusion. I live in Catalonia normally. Let's say we oblige everyone to learn Catalan and only Catalan and everything in school is in Catalan. You are included. Wonderful. But you have zero mobility. All right? Or, to take the same case, we could say, we want our children in schools to be entirely mobile in the world, and we're going to teach them English only, and very little Catalan or Spanish or anything else for that matter. And we would therefore maximize mobility, but have very little inclusion. Okay, you create this elite within, within a culture, and that exists. Many of our cities in Europe have um, English-speaking elites. In Barcelona, there are... Uh, young executives who live in a little world around the Olympic port and speak English among themselves. There are uh, a group of uh, people in Berlin who do the same thing and have no interest in learning German. We found that as well among uh, English language teachers of the British Council who are moving around. So that sometimes they just say, I'm not interested in local culture at all. Right? So that happens as well, mobility without inclusion. The idea here is that the most desirable policies and solutions are those that allow both at the same time. Okay? And then a good solution will be out here, maximizing the range of inclusion and mobility uh, involved. A less desirable solution will be in here. And this often concerns costs. You would have a solution in here, which actually does it, but it takes a lot of social investment and therefore limits the range of what you can do uh, in terms of mobility and inclusion, a best solution is something cheaper, for example, out here. So the model is inherently complex. It's a trade-off between two positive values and the third one, which has to do with social effort or costs involved. Okay, welcome to the wonderful complexities of language policy, ladies and gentlemen, or any policy that concerns a trade-off logic. 
This I, f I have found liberating because prior to coming into this project, many of our debates in Europe have been against English. You know, let's defend Catalan and get rid of, our, of all this. You know. Or people saying, well, English is the future and let's forget about the smaller languages. Here, at least, we have a, an intellectual space where we can look for ways of doing these two things at the same time. And I find that good and applicable to many other parts of the world, I hope. Within that, I'm in a, a work package, it's called, called mediation. It's not called translation, it's called mediation. And we're looking at the mediation choices that people make. When they're confronting a language problem, they don't have the language resources they need to solve a problem, they can do several things. And we're looking at mediated translation, and I'm including there interpreting, and for the purposes of what I'm saying, interpreting and translation correspond to much the same logic. Okay? There are many kinds of translation, but let's just say translation is one option. What would the others be? What else can you do? If you're stuck there, you don't understand what's going on, you need some help, what kinds of things could one do? Ah. Uh. Google it. <laughs> Google translation, free online machine translation. These days we have not just mediated translation but unmediated translation as well, or do it yourself. And what we're finding is that the whole younger generations are doing it themselves. Okay, and they would prefer to do it themselves rather than rely on mediated, rely on a translator or an interpreter, which is a bit worrying in some cases, but we'll see which cases they might be. Obviously, the major alternative is to learn the language of the other. So we've been looking at asylum seekers and refugees in Ljubljana and Leipzig, and we find that they will all say, I am here, and yes, I'm going to learn Slovene. Slovene. Slovenia, yes. Yes, I'm going to learn German. Will you use English? Well, I will a bit if it will help me, but I'm here to stay and I really want to be part of this society and feel included, therefore I will be there. And they're not too interested in these mediated solutions. Okay? But if you look around, you find other things that can be done and are done. Intercomprehension is where I speak Danish and you speak Swedish. And I'll continue to speak Danish, and you'll continue to speak Swedish, and we know enough about the differences between those cognate languages to have a bilingual conversation. Okay, and this is used in many parts of the world quite happily, particularly in Scandinavia. Intercomprehension is a real solution. Uh, speaking Spanish, well, you could try it with Catalan and Spanish. Italian and Spanish tends to work really well. Uh, Brazilian Portuguese and Spanish works well as uh, Iberian Portuguese tends not to work so well, but that has to do with cultural images of the other, I think. Anyway, intercomprehension is on the cards. If you look at history, though, many of these contact situations have developed pigeons, which have evolved into creoles, producing new languages. And that's another option that is there in history. You can learn a lingua franca, and that's what learning English is in many cases. Or even in another study we did on the Russian-speaking community just south of where I live in Tarragona, around Salo, uh, we found that technically many of them were using English as a lingua franca, but then technically Spanish was a lingua franca, because you had Catalan speakers for whom Spanish was a second language, and Russian speakers for whom Spanish was a second language, so in fact, Spanish would qualify as a lingua franca. We're also looking at the role of Esperanto, which is not dead in Europe. Okay? And what you do find so often when you get up and look at the situations of record encounters is a lot of code switching, where people switch between languages, and mixes of all the above. That is, uh, people will opt for one or the other, try it, find it's not working, and shift to something else. 
move between German. German doesn't fail, let's try English. It doesn't work, let's try some English. Let's mix them up and try co some code mixing. Okay, let's try gestures, the origins of pigeons. You know, but. Okay, there's a lot more going on in the situations than just translation. So my grandiloquent introduction to my book in 1992 sounds rather pathetic now, <laughs> as if it were all just translation. No, there are lots of other things happening. It's much richer than a poor translation theorist could realize. The important thing here is that translation as mediated communication, translator with an interpreter there or a translator, is the only one of these that could in any way be construed as blocking language learning. And all the others require some degree of language learning. It can be passive learning here. It can be the learning of a new language, the learning of a different language, a lingua franca. But language learning is the basis of most of the solutions, except this one. And is that why, in the early 1990s, our big battle in translation studies was against the modern language departments? Oh, you're teaching languages. Translation isn't about learning languages. It's completely different. Oh, bilingualism. Yes, you can do research on that. But translation competence is completely different. As if it were. OK. We set up this opposition. We set up this institutional conflict that is coming back to haunt us now, I suspect. When do you need mediated communication? When do you need a translator or an interpreter? There are some cases, and let's just list them. By law, at least European law, in a criminal case, you need it in high-risk communicative situations, and that usually applies to certain medical encounters, which we'll see in a minute, OK? However, these are relatively expensive. It costs a lot to get a professional, a good professional. And if it doesn't cost a lot, then something's wrong. <laughs> uh, either the professional's not paid enough or they're not working as they should. It's a, a luxurious solution for high-risk situations, not just for any old encounter. Okay? We have found in our research a, a surprising degree of resentment, as I realized. People would rather do it themselves, basically because in the uh, asylum-seeking situation, they are regarded as potential spies. You know, I will not tell the truth. You are taking notes on me. Not, ethically, this should not be so. But in those kinds of high-risk situations, for all parties concerned, um, we find them having recourse to their own limited uh, resources of especially Leipzig in German and English or Google Translate rather than rely on a mediator. Even in medical encounters, which is really worrying. <coughs> Most of the mobile subjects, and these are the immigrant communities uh, that we're looking at, um, do regard uh, translation and interpreting as necessary in a first stage when you just don't understand anything and you want to know the law and the regulations. But for all of them, it has to lead on to language learning and there is no doubt about that. We, we ask them all a question. We have a standard questionnaire. It says, if you had free translation and interpreting all the time, would you use it? Nobody said yes. Nobody. They said, oh, well, I need it, but I, I have to learn the language. I have to do this. This man is Eric Pickles, and I pick on Mr. Pickles, not just because of his name, <laughs> not just because of his robust, <laughs> but portentous presence, as you can see. He was uh, in charge of communities in the government of England, OK? And I think this is from about five years ago. He issued a, an instruction to all municipalities in England. This is not Wales or Northern Ireland or Scotland. If you translate for immigrants, they will not learn English. That makes sense, doesn't it? Because I just said, if you give free services all the time, they're not going to learn the language, OK? And the logic is basically there, well, it's common sense. If you give them that for free, they won't work to learn the other thing. 
and he says, it's a waste of money. Let's save all this money, let's not give them translations, and we'll all be happier. <laughs> OK, uh, that has since evolved, happily so, under the Cameron government before it disappeared, after an unfortunate vote. Uh, it evolved into paid language classes, especially for Muslim women immigrants who didn't get out of the home. So it, has, it did evolve into a very good, noble policy, I think, but it started off as a very negative policy based on numerous presuppositions about the way translation works in these situations. What we found was that there is no evidence that translation and interpreting services block the desire to learn host languages. Zero. Quite the opposite. People mistrust it, they don't want to use it, and because of the very imperfections in the social image of translation and interpreting, it necessarily leads on to language learning and all the other solutions. We can tackle as well the economics of it. If you want to talk about social resources and where you're going to invest them, let's talk about that, Mr. Pickles and anybody else in charge of the public purse. This is a study with a lot of people, and it's quite recent. It's in the United States, where we discovered there are quite a lot of studies on this issue. What is the real cost of providing interpreters in health services, and what are the savings, the benefits? And the benefits can be measured in terms of the number of days you spend in hospital, and the number of times you come back after leaving hospital. Like, OK. Uh, do you, uh, are you in the right place for the right thing? And when you leave, have you understood the instructions about the medication, etc. you have to take at home? All right. And um, people with limited English proficiency, LEP, okay, um, spent a, long, a lot more time in hospital, okay, or significantly longer, and ba 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 ba. Okay than for those who had interpreting services, OK? And interpreters were used at admission or discharge, at those two points they're looking at, OK? And the same thing here. Uh, they had a significantly uh, l um, less frequency of returning hospital afterwards. Uh, given the uh, ridiculous costs of a night in an, in an American hospital, the savings are enormous. You could, you, could, you could pay your interpreters five times what they're earning now and still be making savings okay, in this study. The trick, though, is that they are focused on two points of service at entrance and, and, and when the patient goes home. Okay? Because there's a lot of other studies there, and my research team has been through the lot. We were amazed to find all this work on translation that other people in translation studies haven't looked at because it's all in medical journals, so much for our interdisciplinarity. And we found that the um, studies are not as clear-cut. There are some studies that find that, that you make a loss uh, when you make the calculation. And going through it, it seems fairly clear, although we have to, you'd have to get more information than we have, that when a loss of interpreting services are used, that is indiscriminately for every particular meeting, you're not making a profit. So what you've got to use, uh, get, is these services are really needed at those key points where it's cost beneficial. You cannot adopt the logic, say, oh, it's a good thing, so the more we have of it, the better. It is a good thing, but at particular high-risk points. Okay. Obviously, there are high-risk diseases and high-risk medication when you're going to provide interpreting services all along the line. Uh, so it's not, it's not the, the cost-beneficial nature, the, good, the social good or bad of translation and interpreting is not inherent in the thing. It depends so much on where it's used and how well it's used. Okay. Where should it be used? I promised people yesterday I would tell them this, so I'm telling you now. Just, okay. 
in high-risk situ high situations where it's cost-effective. Obviously, it's just common sense. What kind of translation should be used? That's the more interesting question for translation scholars, because we know there's a lot of different ways to translate a text, a lot of different ways to mediate as an interpreter. And I mentioned yesterday the, uh, the AUSIT and uh, New Zealand Society uh, Code of Ethics, which has a very restrictive definition of what translation and interpreting are. Okay? And I related that to this, these, these features. Uh, translation and interpreting are when the person uses the alien I. That means when I say I'm thirsty and I'm an interpreter, I'm not thirsty, that other person there is. They are speaking through me. Okay, that's the alien eye. Actors use that as well, for example. Okay? And I'm not supposed to add or subtract. That's a biblical requirement that comes through the codes of ethics. And it's supposed that there is a complete language change, although I showed yesterday cases of actual loan words and code mixing, uh, code switching, sorry, in, uh, in American hospitals, with Spanish especially. Uh, so that can happen. But the Western translation form, these things really come together in the Renaissance. They propagated out from Europe with modernity. Wherever train lines went, this kind of translation, which we might call equivalent, faithful, accurate, traveled. Okay, and has since appeared all over the world. It's not an eternal form, it has its historical location. For me, that kind of translating which are based on ethics of representation, I will represent what was said, does make sense. It is cost effective because it simplifies things, it reduces complexity. Only in situations where there is no other mediation choice. If there's no other way that this person can know what that person is saying, except me, the mediator, I have to say exactly what was there to the best of my ability. If, however, there are other ways they can communicate, or we have a triadic dialogic exchange so we can discuss doubts and add footnotes and side notes and explanations or whatever is necessary, then you do it because it's all part of mediation. And all those other things, use a bit of this language or that language, use the Google Translate, why not? Okay? But if there is nothing else available, by all means, obey the codes of ethics. It's good to do so. You have to build up trust, and you build up trust uh, uh, using this particular Western translation form. OK, so I'm not against the codes. People yesterday thought I was really dead set against the codes of ethics used in New Zealand and Australia. Far from it. I just want to be able to do all the other things in the right time and place. Mix, mix the Western form up with everything else. That's what our societies are doing. That's why we're getting much better. Food gets much better. Social relations get much better. Fashion becomes great. Come on, you don't want your old Western boring forms to predominate all over the world forever, do we? I want to go now into official language policies and the role of translation within them. I'm really mixing up quite a few things here. I've, I've dealt with that research project that we're doing in Europe. This is the policy dimension of that research project since we're working alongside people who are experts in, in policy. Okay, I'm, I do the translation bit or the mediation bit. There are other groups who work on policy. So I'm starting to find out what policy is. And I'm getting scared of the way, okay. Um, policies seem to be based on laws and pronouncements and principles at the highest level, which then get construed as rights and language rights. Okay? And in this discourse of language rights, we find a, a remarkable absence of the things I've been mentioning so far. For example, there is a Catalan Universal Declaration of Language Rights, which declares that there are mobile languages 
and then fixed languages that have been in the territory for a long time, like Catalan, and the ones that are fixed have more rights than the ones that are mobile. Oh, that's interesting. How did you get there? And therefore, speakers of Catalan in Catalonia have the right to use that as their first language. All right, if you want, you can declare that as a universal right. I'm fine with it. But that whole, it's a pamphlet in every sense of the word. Doesn't say anything about what kind of situation you want to use this language in or with whom. It's not, the costs are irrelevant because a right has no economic price tag, does it? It's immaterial, okay? It's supposed that all these languages are pure and not mixed, as if Catalan, I do speak Catalan and I do like it a lot, but as if it were not in its translational relationships with French and Italian and especially Spanish. There is no dimension of how people feel when they use a language. It's an abstract thing, a right. I will do this because I have the right to do it. It's not, I do it because I feel good in this language or bad. That is alien to this discourse, and I'm going to come to that in a minute. This appears in the European Directive in Criminal Cases, where uh, they have to have the um, accusation and the rights read to them in a language that the accused understands. The emphasis is on understanding. And this understanding, this informational use of language, extends through the whole policy discussion. Okay? A right is uh, independent of sustainability over time, and I think the time dimension is key, and I'm going to come to that in a minute. And uh, no policy wants to allow that, can, that, that there can be situations for which there is no policy. Um, SAS is uh, Scandinavian Airline Systems, I think. These are the planes that fly between Denmark and Sweden and Norway. Not Finland, yeah. They have no language policy. They just say, use whatever language works. So it could be English, it could be Danish, it could be Swedish, it could be intercomprehension, as it often is. And they're quite proud that, as, as their website says, we solve language problems in the Scandinavian way. <laughs> <laughs> they do whatever works for each particular situation. It's a no policy policy. Very cheap. <laughs> okay. Uh, and apparently efficient. Okay, uh, so <laughs> policies tend not to do that. Now, I'm going to pick up all those points in turn. It might be longer than I've got time for, but we'll see. Okay, first one about costs. Now, there's a it, this is this is about the worst diagram I ever published, <laughs> but you got the idea. This is time, all right, and these are your costs up here. And this is what happens when you use a translator, okay? It it's a bit, gets a bit cheaper because the translator figures out the glossary and learns the terms and gets to know the participants, a bit cheaper in terms of effort. But over time, you're still paying by the hour or by the page, okay? And it's still going to cost you the same, 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 same. If you start to learn a language, it's going to cost a lot more at the beginning. But over time, it gets easier, doesn't it? You don't have to work so much. You never get up to where it's completely you know, L1, but you don't have to. If your communicative act, like a one-off business meeting in China, is within this time frame, then you use a, a mediator, a translator or interpreter, obviously. You're not going to start learning Chinese. Especially me, I've tried, I tried it for three years, I'm too old. Just, no, no, I do this thing for age and, no. Anyway, <laughs> okay. But if you get anywhere out here, it's going to be more logical to learn the language to some degree, especially all those different kinds of learning that we've got. So translation is great for short-term things. And you can have a right to translation in a short-term time frame, but not on a long-term, please. Okay, and this might be what Mr. Pickles was getting at if he had thought about something like sustainability or time. I reckon this is about, four, wait a minute, T2 is about four years, 
I worked many years ago on the Barcelona Olympiad, which is the four years prior to the Barcelona Olympic Games in 1992. And I started as a language teacher. And then I started as uh, translating. And we had to do both. That is, we trained the executives in English to get up to good English. And we had uh, lots and lots of translating done. It was logical to mix the two. If it had lasted longer, then we should have just done the language teaching. OK? This is more sophisticated. This is a table based on our empirical studies in the European project I've talked about, uh, which involves many different things. The British Council teachers, the asylum seekers, the Russian-speaking community. Uh, and you see that we've got quite a lot of factors that are of importance to people. This, this is what an academic can do, just sitting down thinking. Yeah. And then you get down and interview people and get the questionnaire data, and you generate the logic by which people actually make these decisions between mediation choices. Uh, I'm not going to go through it here. Pierce is public service interpreting and translation there. That's mediated communication. Technologies is unmediated, OK? What's interesting, though, if you take just those first two, you'll see that they're almost the mirror image of each other's other. In situations where you would logically prefer mediated translation, it's the mirror image of situations where you would logically prefer uh, translation technologies, online translation technologies. OK? Not quite, but we start to map out the kinds of criteria that people actually have when they make these decisions. No one in our interviews, no one in our questionnaires has mentioned it's my right or a language right. It's just not on the horizon of their concerns, perhaps because their situations are rather more harrowing. I, I've been interested in that sort of decision. I, I started to call it performative language policy. You know, we have discussions of gender. And uh, you know, you're born a man or a woman physiologically. And that whole debate has been turned inside out, upside down, uh, by Judith Butler and her work on performative, performative linguistics, performative gender. You perform your gender in each act. It is what it is, what you make it in each act. And that performativity applies very well here, I think. Uh, we have official policy, which lays out its guidelines and its rights and its principles, and perhaps invest funds, if it's good. But people are also doing something similar on the ground in the situations. They are performing their language policies when they choose one particular mediation solution or another. Or when they change, when this doesn't seem to be working, let's try that one. Or well, let's, as a family, start learning this language or speaking this other language at home. Prime cause of language death. OK, these are choices that people make. And I don't think we know enough about them to go ahead and start correcting them. I really need more information on the kinds of choices that people in our communities make the way they solve the problems. And I've been looking at that, at where people make these Decisions about mediation choices. And this book has been something of a revelation in all, perhaps I shouldn't use religious terminology. It's by Anya Woods. She's a colleague at Melbourne. And this was her doctoral thesis on uses of languages in churches in Melbourne, in faith based communities. So it's right there where I'm living. Uh, it was done in the late, the, the data was gathered in 97 to 99. And so what I'm interested in doing next year is replicating the study to see what's happened in these same churches and how they've shifted. But what's important here in this study and why it attracts me is a faith-based community has its languages, not for understand, well, they do say understand the Bible, but you can see it working effectively. It's, it's what the community is, what's bi what binds the community together. People go there because they feel good about using the language in that particular community. We find all these things happening. Everything I mention is used at one area or another in these, in these communities. Okay? Uh, 
They have a lot of code switching. They have interpreters in sermons. They have a lot of, sorry, code switching in sermons. You've got a person saying in one language and saying in the other. And then they've got Sunday schools, which are disguised language classes, conversation classes. Okay? They're doing it all with no help from any policy, no help from anybody. And their aim is over time, is sustainability and language maintenance. They want to maintain their community within this multilingual polity over time. They're doing what our official languages, language policies should be helping them to do, I think. I found this just down the corner. Just, just down that road there. Yeah. Okay, you've got this sign there. It's coming up, right? Well, my son took the photo about half an hour ago, or one hour ago, perhaps. And you can't see at the bottom, but you've got um, Indonesian language service at 12 noon. You've got, you've got an international service in English, but you go along at 12 noon, you've got it in Indonesian with English translation available. OK, if I were, had more days here, I'd go along and see if it's an interpreter or a written document that I've got, probably a written document that I'd be interested to see. Other churches in Melbourne do use interpreters. OK, and over here, Beginner's Bible Study, Indonesian Prayer Fellowship, Conversation Class, and Bible Study. So they're teaching the language as well. This is great. If you want, par I mean, paradise isn't for me. The churches, I told you, the churches are the guys that know the way to paradise. <laughs> Let them give you the discourse. Uh, and they do it through trial and error. Uh, they're evolving. It's actually, uh, the politics are interesting. Different churches help each other out within the same denomination or within the uniting churches. Uh, for the, okay, I won't go into that any further, but that's a whole area of, it's not all happy, let me say. There are different thoughts about how this should go on. And what's changed a lot is the um, uh, immigrant groups from uh, Asia and Africa. The European immigrant communities have all but lost the language. Okay, there are a few places in Melbourne that do have Italian and Spanish, and the Dutch and the German have all but disappeared, unfortunately. Croatian is very strong. They, they have that community, okay? Uh, and then Hebrew is obviously very strong because of the nature of, of the faith. But, but uh, the main immigrant languages, especially Dutch and German, which in this study, still 10 years ago, still had a nominal presence, ha no longer have it. You know, it's, it's dying out. But the language diversity feeling, the drive for it, the need for it, is much, much stronger among the Asian and recently the, uh, the Somalian uh, uh, influx. It, really exciting things are happening there with the new ways of immigration. Okay, everything happens. I'm just closing up now, really. Um, I, I learn a lot about the effective use of language from the work of uh, Brigitte Busch uh, at, at the University of Vienna, who did a lot of research in the Cape, Western Cape. So I've been in Vienna and I've been in, in Stellenbosch, and <laughs> so I'm, I'm very much aware of the kinds of situations she's working in. She gets uh, students, her students and people she interviews, to write up their language histories of what languages they have in their repertoire, when they learnt them, who they spoke them with, and how they feel about them. And you can map this affective language history of how people feel good in one language, and they feel frightened in another language, just particularly in the South African context. Uh, you'll find, amazingly, against the, the, well, the brown people of the Cape, the Cape Coloreds, they're called. Um, very, very positive, effective feelings about Afrikaans, for example, which is surprising because the rest of the population has very, very negative pop, uh, feeling about it in, in the other parts of the country. Okay, so there's a lot to be discovered there, and uh, there is a, a linguistics looking at it, a sociolinguistics looking at it. I just put that in because there's people learning Catalan in Melbourne. You know, <laughs> if you want kids to get excited and like a language, you've got to make it fun. You, gotta, you, know, you, you forget about this. You know, why do I... I feel good speaking Catalan. Just, I don't, well, I don't really know why, but I do, and I feel bad speaking Spanish. 
sorry. <laughs> uh, I think it's because of the people I spoke with when I was learning these languages and the kinds of situations uh, that, that it was happening. Oh, and I feel really, really arrogant when I speak academic French. <laughs> so, so, so I actually like doing it occasionally. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, I, how am I going for time, Vanessa? Because I... For me to speak or for some you questions? Speak and then we'll take one or two questions to put social function. You're all invited to stay out of some great news, but I think we have a few more minutes. Okay. Just the closing comments are for the future of, of my discipline, translation studies, which may not be yours, so I'm sort of confessing my sins here. I, I think what we've got is, is this negative, people, people not looking at each other. Uh, language educationalists still thinking translation is a bad thing to have in the language class. It's not, it, if you know how to use it well and communicatively, and vice versa. We really have to overcome that. Language learning and translation meet in a whole lot of places. This is people crowdsourcing translations of Facebook. Okay, they're participating in it for free. Minako is the world expert in networked participant of crowdsourcing, what do you want to call it this week, Minako? <laughs> <laughs> Collaborative translation, these things. Sorry? Paradise. paradise, yes. <laughs> Paradise, well, we hesitate to call Facebook paradise. <laughs> but they have discovered a way to get people to put Facebook in their language for themselves. This is going into Catalan, I think. No, it's into Spanish. Okay. And doing it socially and discussing it. And then people vote on the best translation. Democratic translation, ladies and gentlemen. Vote for your favorite translation. And it's the one that gets in. All right? Uh, other places you've got around, Amara does, it's a, a site for subtyping, for social subtyping. People do it for free, they do it collaboratively, uh, they do a lot of work. There are many others like that. Dot .sub, which works on the TED Talks, which you're probably familiar with. Those are subtitled into many languages by people doing it for free and in a social way. What's interesting in these uses of, um, oh, I've just mentioned Duolingo as well, uh, which had a, a model based on people, including translation and learning a foreign language for free, as you do it, I don't believe this, but anyway, that's in the publicity. Uh, the learners are correcting web translations or Google translations, if you like, and this is improving the quality of translations on the web. So and all these things, the logic is give people something for free and you generate good translation knowledge of some kind. What it's showing though is that a lot of people translate not as a profession, they translate as a way of getting to know the films and television series they really like, so they're really engaged in it. Learning, learning the technologies, but learning about the English as well because they do it in groups with hierarchies, with revisers inside, so it's a pedagogical experience. And socially, because they have genuine fun and get to know people, albeit online, through this around cultural products that they enjoy working on. That kind of experience is happening well beyond professional translation or the kind of translation that we're teaching in the classroom. But there too, we can learn from what people are doing uh, a former doctoral student of mine, David Orrego, did that quite successfully. He worked for Amara. He got his students put into these online subtitling communities to learn, to see how they learn, to see how that operates as a classroom with some very positive results. So the basic message I'm trying to get out there is look and see what people do on the ground. We need more information about how people are using the technologies using their positions within these multicultural, multilingual societies to make their own language choices and to perform their language policies. Thank you very much.